and welcome to another in this series of videos where I'm trying to decode how the world of diode lasers actually works. Because few people have studied this, they just buy them and use them. And they use them by testing materials underneath the laser and find that they do or they do not cut, they do or they do not engrave, and by various tricks and means they try and make them do some of the things that a CO2 laser can do not as well. With lots of CO2 experience and some fibre laser experience, I'm trying to bring that experience that I've already got about materials and laser understanding into the world of diode lasers. Now, in the last session, I decoded how your laser beam actually cuts wood, and it doesn't. It can't cut wood because wood is basically transparent like glass, but I showed you the mechanism by which it actually happens, a chemical mechanism. So, Today, we're going to carry on with the principle of cutting, but before we do that, I don't want to spend absolutely ages testing materials to say, well, that one doesn't work, that one doesn't work, because I basically know the sort of materials that are likely to cut with a diode laser. You might be able to mark them, but you certainly can't cut them. And I'm going to go into the principles of how I understand and know that and it all comes back to some of the stuff that we talked about in the very early sessions. And you remember I said that all this stuff might seem to be useless, but somehow it all has relevance to the world of laser cutting. And now we're going to specifically home in on some of that stuff with respect to the world of diode laser cutting. I'm using my CO2 laser here as a very convenient workbench because it's the right height for me to lean on. And it's a reasonably nice black background for you to see what I'm going to try and talk about. Now you've heard me mentioning many times about vibration of molecules. When you stimulate molecules with a laser beam, they're not actually getting hot. They're vibrating faster. And heat is a measure of the amount of vibration of a molecule. So temperature has got nothing to do with hotness as such. It's all to do with the kinetic energy that's contained in a molecule. When you put two atoms together, they stay together by this thing here, which I would call a bond. Now, I've got a spring here, but I don't know what a bond is, actually. It may well be magnetism, it may be love, it may be money. Who knows what the hell keeps these two things together? But this is one nitrogen atom, and this is another nitrogen atom. And when you put them together like this, they become attractive with a certain strength bond between them, and they become a molecule. The only thing that these molecules can do is try and escape from each other and they vibrate relative to each other. Now, other various complex molecules move in very complex planes, but we'll keep it simple just to prove the idea. The, the vibration frequency of that is determined by the bond strength and the mass of these two atoms. If I vibrate that one very gently with a low frequency, I'm stimulating that ball at the bottom to bounce up and down, just like a yo-yo, effectively. The frequency of that vibration is dependent upon the length and strength of the bonds and the size of the molecules. So here we've got another molecule, two molecules, because there's an, assume there's another molecule there, but I need to be able to drive this. So I'm going to stop that for the moment, and I'm going to try and make this one vibrate. Now, you can see that to make that one vibrate up and down, I've got to move it a lot, lot faster. And I can't make these two molecules vibrate at the same time. This one is happy to vibrate at this frequency. And this one is happy to vibrate at that frequency. And this one's doing nothing. If you get the frequency right, then you can make a ball bounce up and down perfectly. Because it's what they call the resonant frequency. You've managed to hit the ball perfectly every time and it bounces up and down. It's, it's sympathetic. You need something fairly close to its resonant vibration to make it gain energy. It's a fairly warm summer's evening here and I'd rather be in the air conditioning of the office talking about this than, than out here. I think and hope much to your amazement you found that you weren't using your laser beam to cut wood at all because wood is basically transparent just like glass and that there was some other chemical reaction that was taking place that allowed you to cut the wood without actually using the wood or the laser beam itself. Now, as I've just shown you with my bouncy spring experiments, a very stiff bond between atoms requires a very short wavelength, high frequency to stimulate them because a long wavelength has a much lower frequency of vibration. 
What is the vibration range of various materials? Well, I'm really asking the wrong question there because it's not materials that are vibrating, it's the molecules within the material that are vibrating. Without being a scientist myself, I have to rely on the fact that scientists have already done this work and they know within a very small amount exactly what vibration rates various molecules vibrate at. And in general, what they're saying is the vibration frequency ranges from less than 10 to the 13 hertz to approximately 10 to the 14 hertz. Well, most people that are not mathematicians won't have a clue what those numbers mean. But let me just tell you that a million, as you know, is six noughts. A billion is nine noughts. A trillion is 12 noughts. And so here we are, 10 trillion is 10 to the 13, and 100 trillion is 10 to the 14. So these are not small numbers. These are numbers that are basically unimaginable. But that's the frequency at which molecules vibrate. Now, if we want to turn those numbers into something that are much more understandable to us, okay, so that's a wavelength of that frequency. And 30 microns, just to put it into perspective, is about the diameter of a human hair. And this number here, 10 to the 14, is equivalent to about a 3 micron wavelength. And if we look at what 30 and 3 microns actually looks like in terms that you might imagine or know, wavelengths of approximately 30 microns is 30,000 nanometers, and 3 microns is 3,000 nanometers. So your 450 nanometers stand no chance of vibrating any normal materials. You're six times higher frequency than the range over which materials vibrate. So the chances of you stimulating that vibration with that higher frequency is close to nil. I'm only pointing this out because it shows you how you're being sold something that's not very efficient at doing the job that you think it's doing. And then you have to use tricks or chemical incongruities in the material that allow you to damage the material in some way. So that shows you just how futile firing your diode laser is at materials. Well, we know that we can do some damage to materials, but we're using tricks, as I said. So what we're going to do today is to take a look into the world of materials and see whether or not these materials are stiff, as I describe here, or floppy, as here. Now, all I can say is in general, metals tend to be stiff and plastics tend to be floppy. So the chances of us being able to do something serious to a piece of plastic is pretty close to nil. Yeah, but I'm engraving acrylic. Well, acrylic is a little bit of a special plastic and you're not really engraving acrylic because you can't engrave clear acrylic, for example, because the light passes right through it. It's 95% clear, transparent. So what you could, the only acrylics that you can apparently deal with are those with dyes in it. Now, most of the dyes that you come across in materials are things called azo dyes, which is the modern synthetic dye that's used throughout textile industry, even the food industry, and those are almost certainly the sort of dyes that are used to colour acrylic. Now, there are certain types of dye colour which will absorb 450 nanometer light. And here's one of them, look. It's called Red 19. It's a sort of a yellowy red dye, which may be the sort of colour that you see in the protective screen on the front of your diode laser. Because those strongly absorb light that's in the 450 nanometer region, as you can see. So here's the absorption spectra, general absorption spectra for um, azo dyes. And as you can see, it runs from roughly 350 up to maybe as much as 800, which is beyond the normal range of colours for the rainbow. Now, while I was hunting around for information about azo dyes, I came across this uh, set of advanced chemistry lecture notes uh, by Dr. Phil Brown. So I'm going to use these lecture notes to try and predict what we might expect when we cut coloured acrylics. So this monitor here is driven by three main colours, RGB, red, green and blue. We only see colour because it's reflected off the object that we see. 
So if we see a blue object, it means that the green and the red light are being absorbed by the object. And for instance, if we see green, as we see in nature, it means that nature itself wants the blue and the red for itself to feed the plants with energy. And it gives us the rubbish that it doesn't need, which is green. But on the other hand, if we see red, it means that the green and the blue are being absorbed. So we've only got these three things to think about, three colours, RGB. Whichever one we see, the other two are being absorbed. So that'll hopefully give us a bit of a guide when we come to cutting different coloured acrylics. So let's look at some plastic materials that you might recognise. Polyethylene. When you, when you buy a product, it's packed with this white stiff foam. Generally, there's lots of layers because you can't produce the foam very thick. It has to be made in maybe six or eight millimetre thick layers and then glued together. Well, that's polyethylene foam. There are other forms of polyethylene. This slightly translucent material is polyethylene. Little recycling triangle on the bottom there, which says PE inside it, polyethylene. OK, now the bottle itself might be polyethylene, which is this material here. But then the top itself, which is another plastic, is probably polypropylene. We'll look at polypropylene in a minute. Pure PE polyethylene is this black line up here. Not absorbance in this case. Its transmittance is up here at about 80%. In other words, it will accept 20% of light. There will be a certain amount of damage that can be done, but the rest of it just passes right through. Now, whether there's enough intensity to damage the material, we shall find out. With only 20% of the energy being absorbed, that's probably not enough to damage the material in any significant way. And then we've got another material which used a lot, polycarbonate. Now, some of the polycarbonate that's used for in glazing, for example, has got an anti-reflective coating on it. And the transmittance, that's the opposite to absorption. It's about 90% transmitting. So again, we've only got 10% of the energy that could be going into the material. But will we have enough energy to damage the material? If I had to jump down on one side of the fence, I would say it won't damage. And then we've got polypropylene, which is the top of that um, fungicidal bottle, the black. Transmittance, 60%, which means it could be absorbing as much as 40% light. We certainly might, won't be able to cut it. We should, might be able to melt it. Another material that we might be trying is leather. The main constituents of skin and leather are the collagens and the keratins. Now, collagen, again, if we take a look at the black line down here at 450 nanometers, well, it's pretty close to zero. Keratin, which is the blue line, it's even less absorbent than collagen. So we could basically say that both of those materials are zero. If you, th if you throw a diode laser beam at leather, it's going to pass through just like it does for wood and all the other materials that you throw at it. Because remember what I said, your 450 nanometers stand no chance of vibrating any normal materials. You're so much higher than any molecular vibration. So the chances of you stimulating that vibration with that higher frequency is close to nil. I'm only pointing this out because it shows you how you're being sold something that's not very efficient at doing the job that you think it's doing. You have to choose your materials carefully and then you have to use tricks or chemical incongruities in the material that allow you to damage the material in some way. Now I'm not even going to talk about materials like ABS and PVC because they produce dangerous fumes if you can cut them or make them hot. Both ABS and PVC, dangerous as they are to cut, the chances are you won't even be able to heat them up because look, down at 450 nanometers, the absorption is pretty grim, almost zero. So you can look up the consequences of burning PVC or ABS and the nasty gases that they produce. You can Google them for yourself. The basic principle that I'm talking about here is plastics in general. They're all wobbly materials and they don't respond well to 450 nanometer wavelength light. I'm not a negative person. We'll give everything a fair shot, but what we're doing is predicting what we're likely to find before we even try it. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of scientific method 
rather than spend lots of money buying material only find that it doesn't work. A lot of this information is out there if you want to find it on the internet. Can I cut polycarbonate with my laser diode? Well I'll tell you what let's just go and have a look and see what the answer that is. So here we've got look complete laser cutting material list X-Tool. X-Tool is a diode laser. What not to cut with your diode laser? Okay it's the same sort of thing. Mirrors you should not cut with a laser cutter. Well you can't cut PVC, you can't cut ABS, you can't cut polystyrene, you can't cut HDPE, you can't cut any of these things. I like these diode lasers are also ideal option for cutting and engraving non-metals. Mm. Their wavelength is around 450 nanometers but they have some material limitations. Yeah virtually everything compared with the CO2 laser. They don't really tell you much about what you can cut <laughs> with a diode laser. So anyway I'm not going to criticize them too much. We'll go into the workshop and we'll do some testing for ourselves. You can see I've got a reasonable selection of plastics here that we can play with. Anything from PET, uh, this is PET, this is polycarbonate, we've got some polypropylene, uh, polyethylene, polyethylene and a selection of acrylic. So we run it at what we think is our proper focus, 21 millimetres, 100% power, 5 millimetres a second, 25 millimetre circle, one pass. I don't expect this to catch fire because the prediction is there's no heat going into the material. Take my sunglasses off. It's done a very very small amount of damage, maybe two millimetres deep, which means that if we get some two millimetre material like this very thin material here which is ethylene, polyethylene, it'll probably cut a hole in it. Well to be honest I can't see any fumes coming out underneath so and there we go look we just barely raised the mark on the surface it's not it's not even cut into the surface it's it's just a mark. Solid polyethylene has done exactly what we expected it to do virtually nothing. To be fair that wasn't polyethylene, that was high density polyethylene. A slightly stronger, slightly stronger version of polyethylene. Even the lid for that milk bottle top, if we look at the little triangle on it, it says HDPE. Now this little dog food container, if we look at it carefully, we find on here it says PP, polypropylene. So let's see what this is like at five millimeters a second. Well, there are no fumes coming out underneath. the width of the whole bean that's spread across there and it's melted. So that's pretty abysmal really isn't it? It says on the bottom if we read it carefully on the little triangle PET polyethylene terephthalate. What we've got here is some sheet two millimeter thick PET. I mean the light is going to pass right through it. I seem to think that PET was also no more than about five percent. There's nothing coming out underneath what we're seeing is all the light passing through it. And again if we catch it in the light yeah we just about just about mark the surface if you can see that I mean I can hardly feel that and here I've got a piece of clear polycarbonate I expect much the same sort of thing happens to that as well you can see the occasional flash there so that's where some of the molecules are being struck directly okay much the same sort of thing just a mark on the surface there and surprisingly enough just a hint of something underneath some of the little photon bullets happen to be colliding with solid parts of molecules and losing their energy. But it's a very small percentage and that's basically what absorbance is. Most of the bullets are missing anything that's solid in the material. I mean that's polypropylene which we've already tested. That's PET which we've already tested. So we're now into a material that we love which is acrylic. Now that's black acrylic and because it's black it's sucking in all the light. So the chances are that that is going to be quite good at absorbing energy. Five millimeters a second, it may not go through. But hang on, we're looking at the relative amount of damage that we can cause with a fixed power and a fixed speed. So really we're measuring the exposure time for each of these materials to get an idea of the relative damage that we're doing to each of these materials. Well, we're already cutting through it. Look, we can see the, see the fumes coming out the bottom. It's a nice clean cut. 
and it's nearly out the bottom but not quite just in one or two places it did actually manage to break through that's black which we expected to be pretty good at absorbing the energy now red or this horrible pink RGB red is the color that we see because green and blue are being absorbed and so we're firing blue light at this and we would assume that it's going to be pretty effective and it might even cut well I'm not sure about fully cut well it's not going through no hint of going through nah that's pretty poor to be honest I suspect that might only be a third of the way through if that let's try some green means that that material is accepting red and blue light we should expect a pretty good result but on the basis of that it may well be exactly the same as that one on the back of that red one when I when I shine it to the light there's no indication of any marking on the back we've got a mark on the front if we catch it right on the back there you'll see that there is if I can catch the light just right is a slight mark on the back there indicating that we've got a deeper cut on green than we did on pink and now we've got some three millimeter blue well technically if we think about it blue is the color that we don't want and so we're absorbing red and green light but we're firing blue light at it so we don't expect that to do very much at all to be honest And in the relative scheme of things that's done little more than the clear acrylics and the PETGs and the polypropylenes and the polyethylenes it's just about just about marked the surface now I've got a piece of grey material here well that's nearly white so it should reflect almost everything and sure enough virtually nothing just a hint of a mark that I just about catch my fingernail on well pink is a shade of red and white it may be deeper than blue and grey but I don't think it will be as deep as the red it looks a nice clean cut actually a quick look underneath in the light there is absolutely no hint of any mark on the bottom we'll try some slightly brown tinted perspex and again I would half expect to hear some popping just about get my finger nail caught on that mark but that's if it's a quarter of a millimeter deep hmm I might even be exaggerating at that you know 90 percent of the light is passing right through now i've got what i've got here is a piece of 20 millimeter clear perspex i know you think i'm mad but then again you must know that by now, now i've no intention of cutting this material because i know it won't cut but i hope it will display something else that we discovered in an earlier session now look at those look at those <laughs> I love it okay now we only had three of them three distinct explosions in there because we've got so much power going into that cup now what looks like a black mark there is not a black mark at all that's a shear plane because as I move it around you can see it turns clear catches the light in one direction and then it loses it in another direction but you'll notice something else about both of these marks here they're very black in places well i suspect that what's happened is that's almost carbon that we've produced in there because as i tried to explain to you before when you heard that pack cracking and popping the little photon bullets were going through there straight and okay so they went through there straight but if you take a look at this like a vent hole here it's come up at an angle what's actually happened is at a certain point in this material several photons at an intensity focal point have collided with one of the molecules in that material and it's tried to vaporize it 
and the vapour inside there has caused a shear plane. The hot gas, rapidly expanding gas, has caused a shear plane. OK, now I've got a piece of this same black acrylic that we tested before and it didn't quite fall out at 5 millimetres a second. I've done quite a few dramatic changes now to the settings. First of all, I've reduced the power from 100% to 45%. I've changed the PWM frequency from 20 down to 5, which unfortunately you can't do on your machine. And the speed has now dropped from 5 to 2 millimetres a second. So we're basically allowing a lower power, a longer exposure time. So I'm fairly confident that this will drop out. But we can certainly see the beam is coming out the bottom. It's hanging in there by half of nothing. The cut quality, well it's pretty crap to be honest. The cut quality, if you take a look at it this way round, look, the top edge of the cut is all white. Now, I said all white, not all right. That probably means there's bubbles in there. It's boiling and not evaporating. In principle, it shows you that you can cut something if it's got some assistance. This is what I would call one of those material incongruities. In other words, you think it's acrylic and you think you're cutting acrylic, but you're really using the carbon in that again to heat up the cut and make it evaporate in front of the carbon tunneling machine that we spoke about last time. You cannot add resonant frequencies to a material that doesn't resonate at the frequency of that light. That's the story of this cutting session. And it applies to engraving as well. But engraving is slightly different because you can see we can mark the surface with a lot less power. Right, so here we've got a piece of thick hide. Actually, it's only three millimetres thick. Now, whether this has been tanned by natural methods or whether it's been tanned by uh, various chemistries, I can't say. The settings that I've got on here at the moment were happy to cut through black acrylic. Let's just see what those same settings do for this three millimetre leather. It smells like bacon cooking and it certainly looks as though it's going through. According to all the charts, we said that this was not going to be very successful. Well, it's, it's not a thin cut and it did cut through and, yeah, it's got that carbon on the surface again. So something in there has given us a little carbon tunnelling machine. <laughs> we can clearly see that that's not cutting with the laser beam itself. So the laser beam is creating some carbon out of some chemistry mechanism in the surface and we're using our little carbon tunnelling machine again. That's good news for you that want to work with leather because it does mean to say that you can do something pretty good with it, both engraving and cutting. And because most leathers are very thin, the chances of you setting fire to that are pretty close to nil. And look, here we've got a piece of white calf skin that's been treated with something. This has definitely been chemically tanned. Let's just give this a try. I'm not worried about the speeds or the powers on this. I'm only worried about whether the material cuts. Well, considering that's white leather, my little air assist jet has done a pretty good job of keeping the edges of that cut clean. OK, so leather was better than we expected, but everything else was exactly as. We'll come back to leather when we start doing engraving. On the basis of what we've seen so far, might be the next session. So, I think we'll close it there and say thank you very much for your time and your patience today. And I hope you've learned a few extra things about the way in which your diode laser works.